You are listening to episode eight of the Psoriasis podcast. And today we have the second part of our interview with holistic nutritionist Kezia Hall. Welcome back to series one of the podcast. I'm your host, Gemma Boak, and this is the place where we are talking to a wide range of experts to find out how to live well with psoriasis. Today, we are finishing the conversation we started in episode seven with holistic nutritionist Kezia Hall, and we are covering a wide range of topics, including the lowdown on probiotics and the importance of the healing mindset. So if you've identified something's not working well in your body, perhaps you suspect that you have an issue with dairy maybe you've realized that you're not going to the toilet quite as often as you should be sometimes it's hard to know what to do next so we start up the conversation with Kezia explaining what you need to think about in terms of moving forwards once you've identified that your body is trying to tell you something I think I think if you haven't been to your, your GP recently then do that and get a basic set of blood tests done I just always think that's really helpful and by that you want your iron vitamin d they'll often check your white blood cell like your kind of some immune markers um those kind of things so I always think that's worth doing I know some people don't like going to the GP but um I think it's really important to do so that's um a really useful place to start again if you're anything like me you'll do all those tests and everything will be like oh it's come back normal and you'll be like am I crazy <laughs> it will, but I always think it's worth doing just because you can get um it can uh, tell you some really useful information and then I think probably keeping a food diary if you've never done that before then that's a really really helpful place to start and then really look and you can just do that even if you do it for like five or six days you don't need, like the longer the better but I don't enjoy keeping food diaries to be honest so um I find it quite hard so even if you do like five or six days I think that can be really really useful and then sitting down looking at your food diary and just listening to any kind of gut instinct or your intuition or whatever you want to call it and you can just look at that and be like okay from this do I kind of gut instinct already know of a food in this that is probably not helping me like that isn't doing me good because your body's really clever you probably already know often if I chat to clients about this I rarely will say to them you have to go gluten-free like it'll be like okay what food do you already know your body probably isn't loving and 90% of the time people are like well when I eat bread or pasta I just get really bloated and I feel a bit sluggish and you're like okay, then you can start that conversation. I was like, whenever I have that latte, I just end up on the toilet or like my skin gets itchy or I get really like mucusy in my nasal sinuses. And then you start that conversation. So your body probably, you probably already know. It's just whether whether or not you want to listen. (laughs) (laughs) Which I totally get. Like I'm a big fan of real milk in my flat white, but my body doesn't (laughs) love real milk in my flat white. Alas, it's, uh, it's, it's something it's told me time and time again, but I regularly check in and see has it changed its mind <laughs> and it hasn't. So I think those are really good places to start. And if, and then if you're looking to kind of get more nuanced and drilled down, that's really when you would want to go and maybe see someone for more one-to-one stuff. But I actually think if you can, if you can do that process and check in with your body and you can actually do quite a lot of the foundational stuff to begin with of looking at, okay, what are the foods that are doing me good? What foods do I not think? And that can make a huge difference. Say if you're really sensitive to dairy, meaning that dairy is kind of stressing your immune system out every day and you're eating it consistently. And it's really important to note with this, it's not, it's not always about the amount that you're eating. So some people will be like, oh, I don't eat much gluten. And I'm like, that's not really what we're talking about. What we're, what we're talking about is, is the food you're eating, is it causing a kind of a defensive immune response and that, and you're, and then that it doesn't hugely matter on the amount. It, it does to us. It does influence the, the quantity, but if you are even just getting a little bit of a gluten protein and actually your body is sensitive to that, 
then it will still cause that sort of defensive cascade. So a lot of the time people are like, oh, I don't, I only have milk in my tea. It's not that big a deal. Um, it's, it's not necessarily about the quantity. It's about how the body is responding to the kind of molecules in those foods or the different proteins or the different um, sugars or whatever that are, that are in there. So that, that I think is always a great place to start. If, and if you haven't ran some experiments of being gluten-free or dairy-free and you do have an, or any autoimmune issue, whether it's psoriasis or not, I think it's a really worthwhile experiment to run. And ideally, you want to do it for at least 30 days. And it's really helpful to not set the expectation up of like, if I give up dairy and, and if my entire psoriasis hasn't cleared up in 30 days, then it doesn't work. That's a really unhelpful way to frame it what you're looking for is just how overall do you feel without dairy over 30 days your skin might not change but your energy might do and your bowels might improve and that's a sign of full body kind of rebalancing and that potentially if you stuck with that for maybe six months then you might start then it might start to like leak out into your skin if that makes sense. So I think people often when they rem- look at testing their body around certain foods have quite unrealistic expectations. And with autoimmunity, it does, it can take a while for the body to calm down, actually. Um, and everyone's different. You're always going to Google something. And someone was like, I gave up dairy. And then two days later, it was like I had skin of a brand new baby. <laughs> and you're like, well, great. That's not my experience. So I, do, I recommend avoiding forums and, and Google <laughs> things like that and just listen to your own body. I have, I've had a few clients who have literally been like, some of their action point is do not go on forums. <laughs> I'm like, listen to your own body instead. <laughs> and let's focus on that because it can be discouraging if your friend tried that B12 supplement and everything in their life changed and you took it and you just... That was it. It was just expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and made a difference. <laughs> so yeah. Does does that answer your question? It does. And just to second what you said, that was my experience as well. So I removed dairy and my skin improved a little bit. Um I didn't get mass clearing, but it flaked a little bit less. But my overall skin was brighter. I had more energy. I slept better. Mm-hmm. And um, for me, it was a case of removing several foods. And each time I removed another trigger food, things healed slightly. But um, I'm still waiting for the uh, morning I wake up and I'm miraculously clear. <laughs> yeah, and everything is all... Is all <laughs> it is, and it's, it's, some of it is being okay with that process. Because I'm still the same in, with... I know, so for me, dairy in gluten and, and sugar, actually, just refined sugars really just aren't hugely worth it for um my body but that took me quite a while to come to the conclusion of I think the first thing I removed was dairy really slowly and then it was wheat and then it was but I'm like talking over probably like a five-year period um because I used to be a a big kind of um bread fan and everyone's body is different and it is kind of accepting the process which is really hard because we do I think when you are suffering or you're in pain or you're struggling you do want things to kind of get fixed straight away and um and it and it that it's it, it, there is a process although I would say if if you do if you are looking to accelerate that then getting one-to-one support in in whatever um kind of therapy if that makes sense and whatever modality can be really useful and that's often actually I wish I'd done that earlier for my own health is I spent forever trying to figure things out and then actually when I finally bit the bullet and went to see someone specifically around you know this area or got my own nutrition support or like even last year went and got some acupuncture around some joint issues and back issues I'd had for years that I was trying to figure out like just do stuff myself from YouTube or yeah. do you know what I mean? It doesn't, yeah. It's not necessarily about nutrition. I, I do think that is, um, I think it's, it can be challenging to hear because you're like, well, I don't want one to one support. I don't want to go and pay to see that. Um, I don't know, nutrition person or acupuncturist or whatever, fill in the blank. Um, I do actually think that makes a world of difference because you can get, you just get outside perspective. And I think it's really difficult when you're in your own body to figure out um, what's going on and to know what to prioritize, if that yeah. makes sense. I think that's, a, I find yeah. that really challenging still with myself. So I have a little 
team of people that I, I'll call on that I'll be like, okay, I actually know all this research and stuff in my head, but it's my own body and I'm super confused of what's going on. Sometimes the more you know, the more confusing it is because and actually someone else to be like, okay, Kizzy, I actually think what you really need to focus on. So I did this last year. I went to see a nutritionist for, for me. And she's like, I think you really just need to focus on supporting your small intestine. I think there's still a bit of bacterial overgrowth going on there. And I was like, and she's like, that's what you need to focus on for the next however long. So she made up a plan. We created it, sounded good. And it made a world of difference. Whereas I had been fannying around for like two years being like, why are my joints so? Why am I in there? trying different things? And just someone else's perspective on everything going on in my body, I think is pretty invaluable. Um, so I think that can be a way of accelerating stuff whilst balancing it out with, if you've had an autoimmune issue or if a health issue for any long period of time, it, it, the body takes time also to um, kind of change gear if that makes sense, from yeah. autoimmunity to kind of just happy immunity. <laughs> that really technical medical thing. <laughs> I think a lot of us have been ill for such a long period of time. You've accumulated quite a lot of damage, I suppose, that needs time to mm-hmm. heal and work its way through, doesn't it, once you start healing? Yeah. And I do think, I don't know, this isn't um, from what I've read from research, this is more just from my own perception and head but I do think feel like with skin things as well that there is obviously your skin is kind of one of our first lines of defense but I do sometimes think that the body actually needs to really rebalance and heal into on the inside and and then actually it affect and then that gets expressed in your skin if that yeah. makes sense so I often find with with people and um, with clients whether it's with eczema or acne or whatever it is actually often their skin things might affect like you said with dairy things might affect their skin a little bit in like short term but actually it's that deeper sort of gut work or looking at their hormones or looking at their detox pathways or maybe looking at their genetics and how that's impacting their different pathways in the body and actually as they really do that kind of um, groundwork then that kind of spreads out into your your skin that's not the case I don't think with everyone but I have found that um, I do think that makes um, a lot of sense intuitively. Again, I've not read any research papers on that, so that's the Kezia theory. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes, it does. My head makes a lot of sense. I'm kind of like, you do it in inwards and then that affects out. But, um, and, and, but I think that's really tricky when you are living with skin issues is because everyone see like you see your skin. Like if you have detoxification issues, you're like, well, whatever. No one knows about my poop but people see your skin. And I think that's when it, that does make it harder um, from that perspective. And you see your skin and things like psoriasis can be so uncomfortable. And I've had a few clients and friends that have had it in very bad ways. And it is, it's, um, it's understandable, but you do want it sorted ASAP. (laughs) So going on to that healing from the inside, being projected on the outside, you mentioned (laughs) earlier that, people can quite often eat quite healthy diets Mm. but if you're not absorbing those nutrients then you're not getting all of the benefit from your food so how would somebody go about is it a case of healing the gut or supporting digestion Mm. no it's a great question um I think often in terms of those two things it's it's probably a bit of both um so a lot of the time, um, I find with people that we actually need to support digestion from quite a practical um, point of view. So if you, if you think digestion kind of begins in the mouth or, well, kind of begins with your eyes and senses, but practically it begins in your mouth and then we kind of work down to our stomach and your stomach is where your kind of chemical digestion and mechanical moving meaning that kind of movement and churning that's happening in your stomach I find a lot of time with clients and and people that there is a need to maybe support that actual process of digestion stay in your stomach or in your small intestine and so um things like simple things like just chewing your food properly can be really really helpful it's not a very sexy 
action step or very I find it really difficult I'm a to- I am I'm terrible for not chewing my food properly I think it's growing up like the youngest of four where if you didn't <laughs> eat it off the table do you know what I mean if you didn't eat it then someone else was going to eat it like if you didn't it's not like oh, I'll just save this for later it was like it's on the table if the apple pie will be gone in five seconds if you don't take it and eat it that kind of <laughs> that sort of mentality so I, I'm not great at this myself I have gotten better but things like chewing your food can really help with digestion um things like m- managing your um nervous state or what we might call stress is really essential for digestion so if you are constantly in a kind of your nervous system is in a uh, what you would call like a sympathetic state or like a stressed state or not even just stress like emotionally stressed but you're just productive you're on the go all the day like you're picking up the kids you're going to work you're going to the gym you're coming home you're sorting out the house you're getting dinner on the table you're reading that book you're kind of watching netflix or also like replying to that pta email and sewing that thing and doing that like you're just on the go it doesn't necessarily mean emotionally you're like a basket case but that you're on the go all the time then that means your nervous system most likely is in this what would be a a sympathetic state and digestion is most optimal in a parasympathetic nervous state that's when the body is gonna release most of its kind of stomach acid and all of that sort of good stuff so those are two really really simple things that you can do to support digestion from a really practical point of view also not drinking a lot with your meals that can really really help so having good stomach acid it's a bit like goldilocks a lot of the things in the body are like Goldilocks, like you don't want too much, you don't want too little. So with your stomach acid, you don't want too much stomach acid, but you also really don't want too little. And if you're eating a meal and then you're like downing two pints of water with your meal, you're actually diluting the stomach acid that's in your stomach and all the other kind of enzymes and good stuff that's been released, making it less potent. So I found a lot of that can be a really helpful, easy way um, of actually practically supporting your digestion because it is really, really important that your body is able to break foods down and your stomach is a really important part of doing that. And I find a lot of the time um, the stomach doesn't get a lot of airtime when we're talking about gut health. It's all about probiotics and your intestines, and which is fine, but that I think... Um, beginning there is really, really helpful. And those three things can be really, really useful. And then in terms of your general gut health, I think it's something that it is worth us being mindful of and supporting on a daily basis. So what I mean by supporting gut health is just by being active, like active in helping, but in helping cultivate healthy ecosystems in our gut and specifically within our intestines, primarily the large intestine. So you have your small intestine, which does have some bacteria, but to be honest, it's relatively, it should be relatively sterile. Um, but when you get into your large intestine, then that is like, it's like this crazy garden of bacteria and there's fungus and there's viruses in there and there's all this sort of good stuff. And that's actually really essential for you, for your immune system, for your um, serotonin production, for your B12, like for so many different things. And I think we don't have a lot of modern practices in our culture that really help to cultivate that kind of inner garden for want of a better word, that inner ecosystem. But we do have loads of things that stress that ecosystem out, like uh, environmental toxins, things that we breathe in, the toxins in our foods, our stress levels, the maybe we're not drinking enough, maybe we have loads of caffeine and we're super dehydrated. You know, we are never, we might not be eating enough fiber, which is really important. It's kind of like a really fiber um it's sort of like um compost <laughs> if you imagine your gut is is the is a garden actually adding that really healthy soil that's what way why fiber healthy fibers is really important if you if your gut can tolerate it sometimes it can't if someone's digestive health is that poor um so it's really important i like to think of it i i work a lot on metaphors with people because otherwise it gets a bit too confusing but if you think about it this ecosystem and the inside or this garden actually having daily practices that really support that is really worth doing and and one way that i like to do that is just with fermented foods 
Um, so that would fermented foods or probiotic foods. And these aren't necessarily your like probiotic drinks that are super expensive and often filled with sugar and dairy. These would be like more, your more traditional probiotic um, foods, things like um, kefir or kefir or kefir. I still don't know how you pronounce that anyway but everyone calls it something different which is like fermented milk or you can get fermented coconut and milk things like sauerkraut which i know people are like oh but it actually tastes so much better than you think if you're not if you're having real sauerkraut not um sauerkraut with vinegar in because it shouldn't it shouldn't have vinegar in and things like kombucha which is fermented tea and actually it's amazing all of these things now are a lot more available to buy like i was in a sainsbury's local when I was at uni at the weekend and they were selling kombucha and kefir they didn't have sauerkraut but there was two different options of fermented foods available at my Sainsbury's local I was like this wasn't happening four or five years ago even like if you wanted these things you had to make them from scratch and that's not always an option for people so trying these different fermented and probiotic foods can be really helpful Um, and for 80 percent of people 80% of people will feel better on them. There is a percentage of people that will feel worse and that will be because they have often histamine issues um, in their gut, but that's a whole other topic in itself. But generally, (laughs) most people feel great um, adding and just adding in some sort of fermented foods into your day. And the amazing thing now is you don't have to make every single thing from scratch. You can just go and see what's in your local Sainsbury's, excuse me, or on Amazon figure out which one you like. Um, I think sauerkraut is the best for digestion, personally, because um, you've got cabbage in there, which is can really help stimulate um, like um, your digestive enzymes and bile. But um, kefir and kombucha are a lot more readily available. Um, and those that can be a really, just a nice little way to cultivate that inner ecosystem um, every day. And it's things that you can do, your kids can do, your family can do. Um, and it's just food. It's not, you know, it's not like you're having to add some crazy expensive supplement. It's just a traditional way of preparing food. That's all that probiotic food is. It's not anything newfangled. It's the kind of thing that your grandmas were probably doing, great grandmas were doing, you know, 80 years ago, actually, but it just didn't have that, you know, label on in Sainsbury's. So probiotic food, it was just how you preserved, preserved food. Yeah. Are there any tips that you think we should know about that we haven't covered yet? Hmm. No, I think, I suppose we've covered lots of different things. So I think in terms of listening to your body and the tips I shared around making that a bit more practical, I think that's a really great place to start. Um, And even things like just adding in some fermented foods or trying that and seeing how your body responds. I think if you just take like those two areas that we've spoken about, that that can make a big difference actually for for a lot of people and just by switching those habits. And I think I suppose the only other thing is in this whole process is also being aware of your mindset in all of it. I think that's really, really key. Um, it's very easy when you get onto a, a kind of a healing journey to get very obsessed with the outcome of whatever it is and I think learning to love yourself as cheesy as it sounds like I mean if someone had told me 10 years ago Kathy you just need to love yourself a bit more I probably would have punched them in the face like literally (laughs) like I totally get that people are like whatever yawn but I think it's really really important to actually not wait like put your life on hold or your happiness on hold to be like, oh, well, when my skin is clear, then I'll feel confident. When my skin is clear, then I will, um, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. And I think that's a really, really important aspect. It's actually loving yourself through the process and looking at what what goes on in in between your two ears. Like what? So if I so I might have mentioned trying going dairy free, and that might have really triggered you off. Like, oh, I could never do that. That's way too hard that's ridiculous oh that's so faddy that might have triggered off all those thoughts then I would really invite you to think to to listen to those things and really look at them and look at is it is it actually too hard or is it actually too much like really be quite 
just question and be aware of the thoughts that come up and be really compassionate with them, um, whatever the outcome. Because it might be, it might be that the situation you're in right now that is too hard to remove dairy and that's okay, don't do it, fine. But it might be actually you've been telling yourself these stories or these lies or just these unhelpful things that actually you don't need to believe or invest in. And I think that is a really, again, I think that's really underrated. The power of our thoughts and our minds on our healing journeys is, again, it's a huge topic, but it's hugely powerful. Again, we think that our thoughts are like we're in our bodies and then our emotions and thoughts, these totally separate things, but actually they're completely connected and how your cells function impact your thoughts and feelings and, and vice versa. The things you think impact your cells and your, your hormone levels. So I think that's a really, really important and learn and learning to be okay in that healing process and being happy with where you are now, even though you're looking for things to change, I think is, it's not an easy thing to do, but I think it, it makes the journey a lot more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you can just become one of those like weird sort of like overly healthy people that's just scared to eat anything or do anything that's not 100% healthy. <laughs> and um, that's also not that's not a fun place to be. I don't say that because I've been there and done that. And yeah I mean it's not very balanced is it <laughs> no and it doesn't actually help because you actually when you're in that state you actually tend to be quite stressed so your nervous system is actually when you're in that mindset it tends to be your nervous system is in the sympathetic state which is really difficult for the body to heal in that if you're consistently in that state and so it's actually really counterproductive um but you don't realize that at the time because you're just like well I'm just going to try really really hard and really focus and really do every single thing and restrict every single thing and but actually if that is stressing your body out then you're not going to be seeing the results that you want to see and the best thing you can do for your for your body is to figure out really listen figure out what are what are the key things going on here what are the key foods that are maybe going to help my body, what the key foods that aren't going to help my body, what are the key system pathways in my body that are out of balance and how can I support them? So if it's my immune system, how can I really support my immune system? And what other systems really affect that? Okay, my gut health really does and this really does or maybe you have a genetic predisposition for something, whatever it is, and really focusing on that. And because I think a lot of the time people end up trying to do like 25 different things that they've read about to do with their condition because they've not really been able to get the perspective or the expertise, to be honest, to know what are the like three things they actually really need to focus on. And when you, and actually it's much less exhausting if you can, for your body, your health, your aims, your life, your health condition, figure out, okay, I don't need to do 25 things. I need to do three or maybe four things really well. And I need to do them consistently. And that's what's going to help my body to heal over time. Um, because that also makes the process a lot more enjoyable as well. <laughs> and simple. Otherwise it's exhausting, isn't it? It's, you end up exhausting yourself out trying to get better, which is odd and ironic. <laughs> It is. And that's really good advice about the consistency thing, because I've done so many fad, mm. I want to say diets, but they're not all diets. You know, like I'm going to do yoga every day and that lasts like 12 days because it was utterly unsustainable to start doing yoga every day with no yoga experience at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whereas like saying, oh, I'm going to do yoga once a week for two months or something might have been more it, it, more realistic or whatever it is and I also I always say to people figuring out what is realistic and what can you be consistent in is often the the best the best thing as well as a little bit of strategic insight into knowing strategically what is going to be the most effective thing for you to do consistently because if it isn't having lemon water in the morning then don't drag your head into the sand trying to do it but if actually having some lemon water in the morning could doing that consistently could really help to support your detox pathways which maybe for your body it's really important that you give a little bit of tlc to then that's a habit that's worth being consistent around um if that makes sense yeah so it all ties back to listening to your body doesn't it 
trying something, yes. listening, and then putting a realistic, consistent plan in place. Yeah, and every and 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 listening to your body can look really practical because I know it can sound super like woo, airy fairy, but listening to your body can be a really practical set of actions once you can list once you've learned the language that your body is speaking to you in daily which our bodies do every day they'll be probably telling us little things it's just where they we they often are speaking to us in like some alien language <laughs> and we're just like you're just annoying they're like we'll think well they'll give us a symptom and then we're like i hate this symptom you're just annoying stop stop when actually as opposed to like that bloating you maybe have all the time it's actually your body saying hey hey i have this message for you and we don't know the language of it so we're just like oh my body's so annoying and then every day the body's <laughs> like hey i'm trying to tell you something and we're like oh you're so annoying i'm not listening and uh, it's funny i did that for years <laughs> being like why am i so sick and then now i'm like oh, I know exactly why I was so sick. Like in hindsight, I can completely see all the systems, all the genetics, all the factors, all the, not every single thing, but I can so clearly, it makes total sense why I was so ill um, for, for a long time since a child because I've slowly learned to listen and get test results and do all these different things. And now I'm like, of course I felt like crap. Of course I did. That, that that makes total sense now, now that I know the language of my body. Um, and you can get to that, that place over time. Okay, so if people want to learn more, which I'm sure they will, where's the best place for them to find you? Um, well, you can find out my... My my internet home is supernaturallyhealthy.org. So you can um, find out more about me and my health journey and all that sort of stuff on there. Um, I run a podcast. So if you don't find the sound of my voice annoying on this podcast, then I, <laughs> I have one called The Gut Goddess Show, um, which you can find on my website. Um, and then the best place to get in touch with me, I probably... I'm on Facebook and Instagram, so either of those places, and it's all just at Supernaturally Healthy, um, or if you just Google Kezia Hall, it's thankfully not a very common name, so if you Google Kezia Hall Health, then I tend to pop up, which is quite handy, so you can find whichever, you can find me wherever platform you like, and if you have any questions about what I've talked about, then feel free, I am, I am a real person behind the podcast and behind the internet, and I, I'm really happy to answer people's questions, so um, let me know you're around and get in touch. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. If you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. Simply head over to Instagram and let me know. You can find me at Gemma underscore book. That's B-O-A-K.